Well, hello, hello, and hello. Welcome. This is Majesty Sussex Report. I'm Antonio, and it's an absolute pleasure to have you here with us. Thank you for spending some of your time here. So today, our episode is around racism. Like, we haven't um, talked about that enough or heard it enough or anything like that. But, you know, according to some of what has been happening over the last couple of um, days or, say, the last week or so, and how the UK media, you know, frame this picture of Nigeria, and by doing so, I would say, frame Africa in many ways, and their treatment, their continuous treatment of uh, the Duchess of Sussex, Meghan Markle, also Princess. Uh, it's, it's, I think for, for those of, of us who, you know, understand what racism is, we don't need someone to tell us or show us. We know what it is. We know what it feels like. We can see it from a distance. Um, it becomes a little bit, and especially if, if, if you're in, in, in environments or spaces where it is, um, I don't want to say consistently brought up, but, but, but where you have to point it out or, you know, just by existing, we experience these microaggressions and all of that continuously. So we deal with it on a daily basis. And to have people, you know, sort of tell us that, no, well, I, I, that's not what I meant, or, oh, you're taking it the wrong way, or, oh, you're being too sensitive, right? Or, or, or they will say, well, well, it's a fact. It's not, that's not racist, it's, it's a fact. So um, the episode is going to be a little bit about, well, mostly about that. And, and I, I, I hope you don't get tired of, the, of, of this conversation and, and, do, and, and do stay. Um, you know, I found myself in putting today's podcast together at times getting frustrated because, you know, when I am thinking of adult, intelligent people who are either pur purposefully or by ignorance continue to promote racism and are given a megaphone to do so, it is quite quite frustrating but um i put this together and i do hope you um in, enjoy it um here comes a little promotional piece if you, this is your first time um discovering the podcast um do do stay um i hope you will stay until the end if you found this educational if you enjoyed it do subscribe and um give us a thumbs up because that means you enjoyed the content and please leave a comment. I do enjoy reading all of the comments. Once again, as I say in almost every episode, this channel is in support of the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, Prince Harry and Princess Meghan. If you have a problem with them or you don't like them, then this channel is not for you. Thank you for dropping by and goodbye. Any comments that are left that are rude or obnoxious, um, hateful will not be published. It will be deleted. So please don't waste your time. Time is precious. Okay. Nothing you will say to me is going to re-educate me on my opinion and perspective of Princess Meghan and Prince Harry. Don't waste your time. With that said, let's get it on. Let's go around. The royal family doesn't just go, do you know what? Uh, let, where should we go for a tour? How about Australia? Let's go. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll go there tomorrow. These tours are planned years in advance. And the countries that the royals honour with their visits are very carefully chosen. And I'll tell you this. You'll know this, Michael. You've been on enough royal tours. There's no way 
our royal family would set foot in Nigeria, a country uh, where female female uh, uh, mutilation, genital mutilation is rife, where women's rights basically don't exist, where hundreds of kids are regularly uh, kidnapped by uh, extremist Islamic groups. This is not a country that should be endorsed by anyone, uh, certainly not our royal family. And these two uh, neophytes, they're naive in what they're doing. They're, they're making this country look good when it doesn't deserve it. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't tell you the number of royal tours I've been on, and what you say is absolutely right. You know, Nigeria, the Foreign Office and the American State Department both say it's a dangerous destination, you must not go there. It vies with Johannesburg in South Africa to be the murder capital uh, of the continent. And you and I know uh, that in that country there's industrial scale boiler rooms of people who are ripping off people around the world, uh, internet fraud, wholesale internet fraud, uh, defrauding old ladies, uh, stealing identities, and none of that is ever prosecuted. Now, as we know, uh, there he is on his polo pony playing uh, in, in favor of one of his African charities. As we know, Prince Harry came back and said this country was not safe enough for him. He took his father's <laughs> government yeah. government to court over it. Eventually, uh, a judge... Two so-called journalists in the UK engaged in a discussion filled with subtle racism and unfounded generalizations about Nigeria and other African countries. This conversation not only misrepresented the facts surrounding the Duke and Duchess of Sussex visit, but also perpetrated harmful stereotypes. To understand the gravity of such media discourse, it's essential to dissect the conversation, examine the implications, and reflect on the broader context of how media shapes perceptions. Generalization and Stereotyping The discussion began with sweeping generalizations about African countries, painting them with a broad brush of negativity. The so-called journalists highlighted issues such as female genital mutilation, extremist groups, and internet fraud, implying these problems define Nigeria entirely. While these are significant issues that deserve attention, they do not represent the ent ent entirety of Nigeria or its people. Such a generalization overlook the complexity and diversity of the country, reducing it to a caricature of violence and lawlessness. The language and imagery. The language used in the conversation was particularly telling. Phrases like murder capital, extremist Islamic groups, and industrial scale boiler rooms create a vivid, fear-invoking image of Nigeria. This type of language not only exacerbates the dangers, but also perpetuates a narrative of Africa as a continent plagued by insurmountable problems. This portrayal contrasts sharply with the reality of many African nations that are making strides in development, culture, and governance. The use of such intense language contributes to a skewed perception and reinforces existing biases. Contrasting standards. The so-called journalist comparison between the British royal family standards and the situation in Nigeria implied a sense of cultural superiority. They suggested that the royal family would never visit Nigeria due to its problems, 
ignoring the historical context of British colonialism and its lasting impact on African countries. Queen Elizabeth II herself visited Nigeria several times, which contradicts the claim that the royal family would never go there. This selective memory serves to uphold a narrative that some countries are inherently superior to others, perpetuating colonialist attitudes in modern discourse. Implications for the diaspora and immigrants. The negative portrayal of Nigeria and other African countries has far-reaching implications for the diaspora living in Western countries. Such media narratives can lead to discrimination and social alienation, reinforcing stereotypes that affect the daily lives of immigrants and people of African descent. When media figures perpetuate these stereotypes, they contribute to a hostile environment that undermines the progress and contributions of the African diaspora. Responsibility of public figures. Public figures and media personalities have a significant responsibility in shaping public discourse. The dissemination of biased or uninformed opinions can cause harm and perpetuate stereotypes. In this case, the two so-called journalists failed to acknowledge the positive aspects of Meghan Markle's and Prince Harry's visit, which was not a royal tour, but that by the invitation of the Chief of Defense of Nigeria. Their visit focused on promoting mental health and discussing the potential of Nigeria hosting the Invictus Games in the future, and indeed of the Invictus Games. They also engaged with Save the Children Nigeria staff in Abuja, addressing crucial issues like gender-based violence and healthcare within the nation. The importance of accurate representation. The conversation also conveniently ignored the context and purpose of the Duke and Duchess of Sussex visit. Meghan and Harry were there in their capacity of supporters of various charities, aiming to bring attention to important social issues. By framing their visit as naive and dangerous, these so-called journalists undermined the positive impact of their efforts and the potential of benefits of international collaboration. The segment serves as a stark reminder of the subtle racism that persists in the media discourse. The generalizations, fear-mongering language, and colonialist undertones contribute to a distorted view of African countries and their people. It is crucial for media outlets and public figures to strive for accuracy, fairness, and empathy in their reporting. By doing so, they can help dismantle harmful stereotypes and foster a more inclusive and understanding world. In the case of Meghan Markle and Prince Harry, their commitment to charitable causes and efforts to promote mental health and social justice should be recognized and celebrated. Their visit to Nigeria highlights the importance of global collaboration and the positive change that can arise from such engagements. It is through understanding and collaboration that we can move towards a more equitable and just society. So I say to so-called journalists, it's time to grow up. It's time to pull your socks up, put your proper pants on, Put your brain in properly and do the job that supposedly you went to school for. If now you didn't go to school for any of this, then perhaps have an opinion that is not 
producing misinformation, creating more stereotypes and harmful things within the world. You're either the problem or you're the solution. Which one are you? Grow up. Now, did the BBC really have to sack Danny Baker? I have to declare an interest. I was the producer of a show with Danny more than 30 years ago, and I've always thought of him as a really good bloke, a brilliant broadcaster, and one of the funniest men I've ever met. And anyone who knows Danny knows there's not a racist bone in his body. So for him to be sacked for tweeting a comment about the Duke and Duchess of Sussex baby with a photo of a suited chimpanzee in a top hat seems a bit over the top, especially as he was contrite once his mistake was pointed out to him. No one believes it was intentional racism, so they say. And Danny claims he didn't even know Meghan is mixed race. Of course, he should have done. And of course, he shouldn't have done what he did. It was stupid and insensitive. But as a former BBC Director General, I ask, would I have agreed with the decision to sack him if it had happened when I was there? The pressure to remove him would have been intense, but I rather hope that I would have resisted. Mel Lassman was a Canadian businessman and politician who served as the third mayor of North York from 1973 to 1997 and the 62nd mayor of Toronto from 1998 to 2003. He since passed on December 11, 2021. The then mayor of Toronto says he did a wrong thing. He apologized for joking about cannibals in Africa, comments that officials feared could erode African support for the city's bid to play host to the 2008 Olympics. Before visiting Mombasa, Kenya, two weeks ago to promote Toronto's bid, Mayor Mel Lassman told a freelance reporter writing an article for the Toronto Star that he feared going there for a meeting of the Association of National Olympics Committee of Africa. In quotes, what the hell would I want to go to a place like Mombasa? End of quote. He was quoted as saying, adding that the, he feared snakes. He also said, quote, I just see myself in a pot of boiling water with all these natives dancing around me, end of quote. One senior African Olympic official said, the remarks could cause IOC members to take another look at the Toronto bid, which has been graded as one of the top three. And so they did. And Toronto lost out of getting the Olympics. And now this. What was very interesting for me, and I think it's a really good point of, of Richard Kay's, the fact that 
you know, on, on royal tours, which are also very heavily scripted as well. There will be a lot of walkabouts, yeah. a lot of meeting people. And you don't know what reaction you're going to get. And, and sometimes we've seen in the UK recently, you know, uh, Republican demonstrators have used those things to those walkabouts to campaign against the monarchy. And, they're you know, they're perfectly entitled to do so. There are never so going to be any demonstrations on this tour, not well, with well, the level of security. Well, well and... exactly. And also I thought what was very interesting, and I, I promise you I'm not saying this as a gripe as a journalist, but also on those royal tours, there's a, there's a wide variety of, of, of royal tours um, with a wide variety of journalists um, from all different papers, from television, from radio, photographers, not always people with a, a positive view in their paper of the monarchy. What was really interesting about Harry and Meghan's trip is that nobody was allowed to cover it apart from one hand-picked journalist and one hand-picked photographer. Right. Both of, you know, one journalist from publication that's very, very pro Sussexes in the US and, and their own photographer who they've worked with for a long time. And I, I thought that was quite interesting given the criticism that Harry has levelled against the media and the royal family but also this kind of uh, position he puts himself up there as, as a kind of a commissioner against, you know, misinformation. Yeah. And yet everything was very, very, very much pushed out through a very narrow prism. of, uh, And they very much controlled the way their, their tour was, was seen in public. Mm. I, I just thought that was very interesting. Look, I don't want to call anyone names. I don't want to call anyone stupid. I don't want to call anyone lack of analytical skills. I don't want to call anyone um, uh, intentionally misleading and providing um, information that is not correct. I don't want to call anyone um, that is making a comparison that should not be made and that's not there. I am not going to do any of that, right? Because um, as she said, she is a journalist. And I would hope that she would be upholding the most highest standards of accuracy of information as she delivers such a statement because she's a journalist. She's not a storyteller, right? That is telling stories even though that's part of journalism, but one has to back up the stories that one is saying or telling, right? So let me just dissect a little bit of what she just said. And let me be really clear here. I think I can take this to a grade, let me see, maybe seven or eight, or maybe even lower, and let them listen to that statement and then let them dissect what is wrong with everything she just said. So let's start with this. Royal Tour versus Invictus Games promotion and mental health promotion, right? So the whole claim that she starts her premise with is that it implies that Harry and Meghan's tour should not be seen as a royal tour, right? Because they've been saying, oh, this is not a royal tour. Don't compare it to a royal tour. But when it's convenient for them, right, um, now it's being compared to a royal tour. So which one is it? Now, the reality is Harry and Meghan were invited by the Nigerian um, government, Nigerian general, to promote the Invictus Games and mental health. Not as representatives of the British royal family or um, the government of the UK. This distinction is important because it separates their activities from official royal duties. So none of what they, they were doing is an official royal duty. They're there in the capacity, right, of them representing a foundation or representing the in Invictus Games and, you know, the causes that they promote. The next thing is, the next contradiction, media coverage control versus transparency advocacy. The journalist criticizes Harry for advocating for transparency while controlling media coverage of their visit by selecting specific journalist and photographer to cover them. 
Here is the reality, my friend. Harry and Meghan's selective approach to media coverage is a response to their negative experiences with the UK press, which has previously published false and damaging stories about them and still do to this day. Their choice to work with trusted media is a measure to ensure fair and accurate coverage which aligns with their stance against misinformation. Contradiction number three, security and demonstrations. The journalist mentions that there will be no demonstrations on the tour due to the level of security. This point is tangential to the core issue. Security measures are standard for high profile figures to ensure their safety, especially given the contentious history with the press and possibly public demonstrations or anything like that. And aren't you, you journalists in the UK have been saying over and over, beating this racist drum about how unsafe Nigeria is? So wouldn't it be proper for them to have the proper security? All right, next point. <sighs> so motivations behind this framing, right? So, so why? By framing Harry and Meghan's visit as akin to a royal tour, the journalist creates a misleading comparison that sets up unrealistic expectations and criticism. This serves to undermine their independent initiatives and paint them in a negative light for not adhering to royal protocols. <laughs> and royal protocols that they are no longer bound by because they love to invent these royal protocols. The criticism of their media control is an, a, an, an attempt to portray Harry and Meghan as hypocritical. However, this ignores the context of their past mistreatment by the press and their efforts to protect their narrative from being distorted. The selective media approach is a strategic response to previous harmful experiences, not a contradiction of their advocacy for fair media practices. I would hope that you can see that. You are a journalist. The overall narrative appears to be driven by a desire to discredit Harry and Meghan, by highlighting perceived inconsistencies and framing their actions negatively. The journalist reinforces a biased view that aligns with certain segments of the media and public opinion that are critical to the couple. The journalist's statement is riddled with contradictions and misleading comparisons. By dissecting the points made, it becomes clear that the criticism lack a fair and balanced context and are instead designed to undermine Harry and Meghan's independent initiatives. Their selective media strategy is a legitimate response to past experiences and their activities related to the Invictus game and mental health promotion are separate from royal duties. This purposeful misrepresentation serves to perpetrate a biased narrative against a couple. And I love how very, um, uh, so 
so so quietly um, the journalist expels these words from her mouth as if everything she was saying was just factual. Now, what she is saying when it comes to a royal tour, listen, factual as, 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 as much as she wants to say it is. But she's comparing it to Harry and Meghan's visit. They're not two royal tours to be compared. They're two different things. So you can't compare an apple and an orange. Yes, they're fruits, but one is an apple and one is an orange. And this is the problem with our media. We have people who have, I, I, I hope you went to school and you do have a degree in journalism, who we're supposed to trust to deliver us with information that is truthful and accurate and not information that is biased. Like, what is wrong with you? They're so blinded by their commitment to hate. Yes, they're committed to hate. Even the other one, who's like, look, look, I don't, I don't name these people because there is no, I have no intention to to name them. They're either that person, this person, that one, the one on that channel, okay? Because they are basically all the same to me. After <laughs> what she might have thought was this big scoop, and she was having her big dissertation about Archwell. You know, all of a sudden, she's like, well, you know, um, the, the, um, <laughs> Harry and Meghan, press people, they're going back and forth. Now this is the third iteration. I, I guess, I guess um, everything was fine, but it's very interesting how they're trying to blame it all on the government when it's there. And I'm thinking, lady... Lady, <laughs> like, come on, come on. And then the, 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 the whatever, the announcer, the, 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 the teleprompter reader, um, she goes, yes, you know, I was, I was quite upset or something to the, to the, to the regards because I, 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 I was just, like, wonder why would they ask someone to talk about female empowerment when she can't even, like, pay her bills for her charity? You folks, do you hear yourselves? Do you hear yourselves? You sound like a bunch of... Uh, no, I will not say it, because that will just be rude. And, you know... I was brought up with English manners. It is, it is flabbergasting to me how these people tie themselves in a knot in order to just spew hatred, misinformation. Do you folks know that that stuff lives with you? Words matter. What you say matters. You may think it's all fun and games. You're getting a paycheck for it right now. It's all fun and games. But it's all coming out of your mouth into the universe. And there is a God. You may not believe there is one. But there's also this thing called karma, if you believe in that. You are just sad, sad, sad people. You're wounded people. You're injured people. You really need to go take care of your inner child. And and as as James O'Brien said, like you know, go to therapy. That inner child is 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 angry. Is has 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 been holding on to things and 
what what that inner child is doing is just lash, lashing out and 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 you know you <laughs> this time in the history of britain and British media and press is a sad, sad time because I, th I think most people see it for what it is. And as a person who used to hold you folks up, I'm not saying the tabloids, but admired the way some of your reporting was, 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 was um, delivered the insights. Now I just look at all of you and just think you're just a bunch of liars. A bunch of liars. Oh well. Words are things, I'm convinced. You must be careful about the words you use. Or the words you allow to be used in your house. In the Old Testament, we are told in Genesis that in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God and the Word was with God. That's in Genesis. Words are things. You must be careful. Careful about calling people out of their names. Using racial pejoratives and sexual pejoratives and all that ignorance. Don't do that. Someday we'll be able to measure the power of words. I think they are things. I think they get on the walls. They get in your wallpaper. They get in your rugs, in your upholstery, in your clothes, and finally into you. Thank you for being part of this discussion, for um, staying until the end of um, today's episode. There is more that I had planned to integrate into this episode, but I've made the decision to um, do this as a two-part. So this is part one. Part two, I will either upload that later today or perhaps tomorrow. And part two is more of a personal discussion and personal experiences um, off of an ITV um, program that was done after the um, Oprah interview with Harry and Megan. And okay, I'm not going to say much more about it, but um, I, I will um, share my own personal experiences in regards to this um, subject. and. You know things that are, are, are that are today um, very alive and um, still living through the consequences of um, people's attitudes and racism and 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 all of that and how institutions, while they may say they're there to defend us or protect us, they're actually not there at all to protect or defend us. They're there to protect the image of the institution. Um, so, um, once again, thank you. I, I hope for those of you for, um, who are discovering parts of what racism means and how it is so subtly, uh, not, not subtly, so, so, um, insidiously, I'm going to use that word instead, insidiously, um, creeps into a lot of spaces and things that we do, how microaggression sort of works. And for a person who doesn't understand this or has lived this, they don't really see it because it's not part of their everyday narrative. But for a person of color or a minority person or a black person, these are things that one doubts with every single day. And it becomes part of our fabric. It becomes part of of, of us just sort of many times making that decision to say, you know what, this is not worth my time, this is not worth me getting upset over it, let's just move on. 
and we tend to just sometimes let let a lot go until we can't anymore. And that, I would argue, is part of that journey that um, Megan went through. So as much as in the British media, they will continue to say, well, I'm not a racist or I'm not I'm not racist, or that wasn't racism. As part of my research for today's episode, I watched a lot of the um, Loose Women um, episodes where a lot of the uh, co-hosts on that show, especially one in particular, you know, would, 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 would excuse certain things or question why the person of color was 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 seeing something a certain way or feeling a certain way. And I find it so insulting. It is absolutely so denigrating and insulting when you have someone who does not understand, will never really understand, right? That, like, like, like listen, there's certain, are many experiences that a woman will have that I as a guy, as a male person, identify as as male, cis gender male, that I will never understand. I can empathize with it. I can say, how may I help? How can I be of 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 use? How can I be an ally? How can I advocate for you? But I'll never because I'm not female. Right? But I don't have the right to question when a female, a woman, a, 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 a person identifies as a female comes and say, here is my experience. And me just question them on it. Right? And it's, it's interesting to me also when I see black people, people of color, on television, because it's a very prominent man um, who also conducted a show a, um, after the um, Megan and Harry interview with Oprah, because, you know, this, this, this interview is mentioned for every damn thing. And the way he treated the subject matter was, was almost as if it were a joke. You know, he himself identified and said he had worked for the Princess Trust and how much it had helped black people and all of that. And the way he handled and the questions he asked was just with such carelessness and disregard for the importance of the subject and also for the importance of what the Duchess of Sussex were saying. And that to me is one of those sharp knives that just goes into you very slowly because you see someone of prominence, of importance, who just trivialize such an important topic and subject and they have such an opportunity to do better because I know they know better. Well, I would hope they do. I mean, I try to be understanding to think, okay, so you're in this position. I'm sure there's many things you've had to do to get to that position. I'm sure there's many times you've had to shut your mouth. I'm sure there's many things that you've had to tolerate. I'm sure that you've had to work 10 times harder for the position that you are right now and you're scared to lose it because you, only you know what you've had to do and how hard you've had to work. But sometimes you have to think about the legacy that you are holding up and the legacy you're leaving behind. Thank you for watching. Until we speak again. Spirit, take me from this place or let me run free Place me right within the view beneath the tallest tree 
Let the vain and proud drown within their vanity Soften now, soften now Spirit, take me from this place, or let me run free. Place me right within the view beneath the tallest tree. Let the vain and proud drown within their vanity. Soft and now, soft and now.